taken from around the lake. We went out and actually measured the pesticide levels in the soils in the farms, and we also measured it in the water in the lake and the water going from the farms to the lake to see if those pesticides could still be there. The investigators test for more than 50 of the most likely toxic substances. But when the results come in, the findings are uncanny. The pesticides that were of concern were pretty tightly bound to the soils. And they were either in the sediments or they were still in the farms in the soils, but they weren't getting into the water column. Pesticides and contaminants are present on the land surrounding the lake, but none of them seem to be finding their way into the water in any significant amounts. And they aren't finding their way into the alligators either. The pesticide screens were negative. Um, there was no evidence of mercury. There was no evidence of lead. There was no evidence of the common uh, conditions that we attribute with um, abnormal brain function in animals. All the tests we ran showed that pesticide levels were moderately low. And they weren't any different than any other time that we've ever measured pesticides on alligators in Lake Griffin. So nothing had really changed in terms of concentrations we were finding in alligators. But the water samples reveal something else. The water of Lake Griffin is teeming with microscopic algae. The algae aren't visible to the naked eye, but they're in the lake in unusually high concentrations. And that's cause for alarm. We were seeing the appearance of certain algae that produce toxins. They call them cyanobacteria or cyanotoxins, and uh, they're poisons. When these tiny blue-green algae die, they release a cocktail of chemical toxins, toxins that are well known for attacking the central nervous system. This can cause weakness, paralysis, brain damage, and even death. At last, the media have a culprit to blame. And the trail of evidence heads straight back to the muck farms. Activities around the lake, agricultural activities, development activities, caused a flushing of nutrients into the lake. Nutrients are something that animals and plants need for survival, but in large amounts, they cause a richness or a density in the lake that triggers a change in the ecosystem. These nutrients are saturating the lake to such an extent that suddenly blue-green algae run wild. And so we went from a lake that was much lower in nutrient levels, but had good populations of vegetation in the lake, to a lake that was dominated by algae. Once the algae take hold, they become the driving force of the lake. Overwhelming, choking, suffocating. Less competition means more nutrients for the algae. They become unstoppable. But as they die, they release neurotoxins into the water. And neurotoxins kill neurons. Over two years into the investigation, deaths now in the hundreds, the team finally has a prime suspect. But once again, the evidence fails to support the theory. The investigations showed that there were no cyanotoxins in the alligators, at least not in any concentration that could be harmful. It's another frustrating conclusion to a promising lead. In the search to solve the mystery behind the zombie alligators of Lake Griffin, there's to be one final twist a chance encounter at a conference in Maryland 
leads the scientists to a compelling piece of evidence. One of our colleagues was talking with Dale Honeyfield. They got to mentioning the types of work they were doing, and he mentioned that they were dealing with a salmon mortality event. Honeyfield is heading up an investigation into abnormal deaths of salmon and trout in the Great Lakes. They started comparing notes and found out some of these clinical signs that they were seeing were very similar. Honeyfield's salmon appear to be suffering from a neurological disorder just before they die. He first notices the symptoms among the baby fish, or fry. The fry would hatch, but then shortly after hatch, before they swam up to, for their first feeding, they would die. Like Woodward and his team, Honeyfield had trouble identifying the cause. We could not find any relationship with contaminants, with bacterial or viral infections. Uh, they, were just, they were just dying. They seemingly were healthy otherwise. But as he studied more adult fish, Honeyfield began to see bizarre behaviors, just like those seen in the Lake Griffin alligators. They lost equilibrium, rolled over, and sank to the bottom of the tank. This footage, taken at the time of the experiment, shows that Honeyfield now has fish that can't swim. This leads him to test for neurological disorders, which takes him directly to the brain. He finds lesions, tiny holes in the salmon's brain, very similar to those found in the alligators. Areas of dead and dying nerve cells are transmitting much slower chemical signals. But what's causing it? Honeyfield spends the next six years trying to find out. Having found no evidence of disease or pollution, Honeyfield decides to look not for something that's there, but for something that isn't. Could the deterioration of the brain be happening because the animal's lacking an essential nutrient? Honeyfield begins a series of tests in which he doses the lethargic salmon with a variety of chemical substances. One particular substance called thiamine has a profound impact. When fry are affected, they're lethargic. They lay on the bottom of the tank, similar to what we see right here. It may not be real clear, but there's hemorrhaging around the gill and pericardium region. If you look at normal fry, they're up swimming in the, in the water column, just as these are. They look bright, they're healthy. And if you take those fish that are in the previous slide and treat them with thiamine, within uh, approximately an hour, they will be all back up in the water column. It's like magic. The footage shows fish that were once close to death suddenly healthy again. Once the thiamine gets into their bodies, then they resume normal function. The results are remarkable. Honeyfield has successfully pinned all the symptoms on a simple lack of thiamine, a natural substance otherwise known as vitamin B1. Without vitamin B1, the body cannot process the energy that it needs for normal body function, for movement, for cell reproduction. The whole process shuts down. In a healthy body, there's a constant turnover of cells. They die and are replaced. But brain cells are much slower to regenerate. Without thiamine, the body lacks the energy to replace them. The lesions found in the brains of the fish match those in the alligators. It was almost unbelievable that, you know, here they were in this, uh, what a lot of people believed to be a very polluted lake, uh, what a lot of people believed uh, was probably a pesticide or some other nasty pollutant. And we're proposing that it's possibly a dietary deficiency, a, a nutrient deficiency, vitamin B. To test the theory, Terrell is asked to take more tissue samples from the alligators. 
What I asked the folks in Florida to do was to send me some tissue samples of dead alligators and some healthy alligators so that I could look at the thymine levels in their tissue. And what I found was that those alligators that were most impacted, that had neurological effects and, and motor skills that were most impacted, had the lowest level of liver and muscle thymine. We had no idea that a thymine deficiency could occur in a wild population. It was almost a crazy theory because how do these wild animals in a wild environment eating a natural diet have a vitamin deficiency? Um, you know, it, it doesn't make evolutionary sense, it doesn't make ecological sense.